Well, we'd like to welcome you to our service here on Sunday, January the 31st, 2021. And isn't it hard to imagine our first service online was March 29th, 2020. Ten months. This is what we've been doing. It's been a journey. It's been a journey of learning and growth. But it's been a journey where at least we continue to be able to worship. And that has been so important for us, hasn't it, during the course of this pandemic. We've had so much change, but one thing hasn't changed is our love for God and our ability to be able to worship God. Isn't that what's kept us persevering, kept us sane, and kept us going? And that is why we are so thankful that you have joined in for us today. We know that many of you are enjoying our online services, and we are just so thankful that we're able to provide that. But we miss each and every one of you. We do look forward to that time when we can regather again safely in worship to see our brothers and sisters again. But until then, let us enjoy these online services. Let us enjoy the opportunities we are given to worship God. So let us begin with, welcome to this house.
through this service, you'll see this theme played out. Seeing what Jesus wants us to see. And one thing he wants us to see is the light. But something else he wants us to see is our need for forgiveness. So let us come and sing. We come to ask your forgiveness. Let's go. 
has its moments of joys, but difficulties. And I was reminded of one such season for one such person recently. We've all heard the name, or many of us have heard the name, of Corrie Ten Boom. Many know her story. During the Second World War, her family hid Jews to keep them safe from the Nazis. And you would think, with doing such a good, an honorable thing, that God would keep them safe. But they were discovered what was happening. And think of Corey's life. She had to live in a concentration camp. She experienced the death of not only her father, but her sister. She lived in horrendous situation in a concentration camp. Brutality hardships, suffering. It wasn't an easy journey. Imagine her thoughts and emotions about God, her disappointments. But then she got through. She was one of the lucky ones who persevered through that tough time in the concentration camps. And something that Corey did as she went on, she gave speeches. She shares her stories. And the interesting thing is, when she would share her stories and give a speech, she would always look down. And many people wondered, was she reading from notes as she looked down? Others wondered, was it just too hard to talk about? Is that the reason she looked down? Or maybe, was she nervous? Did she not like to look at the people that she was talking to? But none of this was the case. What she was doing as she was talking and telling her story was doing needlepoint. And then after she finished her story, she pulled up the needlepoint and then showed the back. She showed the stitches. She showed what it looked like from the back. It didn't look that pretty. It kind of looked disjointed. But then she said, this is kind of how we look at life. This is how we look at our tough times, our realities. But then she said, this is what we need to learn to do. She turned the cross stitch over and showed the beautiful side, the completed side. The side that she wanted to display and said, this is what we need to remember. To look at things from God's perspective. And even as we're going through tough times, to see God's beauty. That God is going to make something good happen out of it. So here we are. Many years since that time. And for many of us, Life seems to be blue, doesn't it? We're down. We're discouraged. We're frustrated. Many parents right now are frustrated that kids are not going back to school yet. Many business people are frustrated that stores are not able to open, that they are struggling to make ends meet. And maybe many of us are frustrated that we still can't give people a hug. We still can't celebrate maybe birthdays and anniversaries. This has been hard. And maybe you're looking at your life right now and all you see is blue. Nothing good. If you ever find yourself in that moment, remember Corey's words. We just need to change perspective and begin to look at things from God's perspective. And doesn't it make a difference as you look at this pillow? Yes, we still see the blue patches. That is still reality in our life. But you see, when we look at things from God's perspective, we see something more beautiful. Some of the beautiful things that God is going to make happen out of this. What are they? Maybe 
a more beautiful sense of appreciation for your family. Maybe a more beautiful outlook on the freedoms that we have in life. Maybe to have a more beautiful sense of appreciation for work or your experiences with friends. Or how about this? Coming to church and being able to worship God side by side with your fellow believers. So yes, there have been many times we've been feeling this way through the pandemic. But let us remember and ponder in those moments what Corey Tenbu wanted her people to know. Change your perspective. Look at things from God's perspective, and you'll see the beauty that God is going to make happen. Let us ponder and let us learn. Our hymn is it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Through 
the life of Christ. Began as we celebrated Christmas, then we looked at the first 40 days when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple on three different occasions to do all that the law requires. Then we looked at the visit of the wise men, then fleeing to Egypt and returning back to Nazareth, then Jesus at the temple as a 12-year-old, and then last week, 18 years later, we looked at the baptism of Christ. Now, naturally you would think that we would move right to Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And if Lent wasn't fast approaching, that's where we would be going next. But in a couple weeks' time, we're going to do that story. So, I've chosen instead to look at the call of Jesus' disciples. And as we're about to see in this story, Jesus once again uses some words that is so important for us to understand, for us to realize that he wants us to come and see all that is so fulfilling, being a servant of Christ. Let us join, let us read John 1, verses 35 to 51 today. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told them, We have found one, the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I remember, I think I was maybe five or six years old when I first discovered I was colorblind. And I remember the nurse who did the testing on me said I was the worst case she had ever discovered. Good news, isn't it? It's something I've struggled with the course of my life. And just before Christmas, there was three different times I was reminded of some of my realities being colorblind. The first was up at home sets. Now Nadine wanted to get some pillows for Christmas. 
She wanted pillows that had both gray and yellow in them. So I went out to Homesets, found the section, and began looking at all the pillows on display. Finally, I thought I found them. There was a perfect pair there that had both yellow and gray. But then I began to second guess myself. So I pulled the pillows off the top shelf, made my way over to one of the sales associates and said, I bet you you don't get this question very often. I said, I'm colorblind, and these are for my wife and I better get it right. So I said, is this yellow or is this gold? And what did she do? She gave me the strangest look. She said, yeah, I don't get that question very often. But then she finally confirmed for me that yes, indeed, it was yellow. That was my first reminder of my reality during Christmas. Then I was getting ready for the service on Sunday, December 21st, and I thought, you know, it's getting close to Christmas. It might be good if I wore red. So I went into my closet getting ready for the service and just so happened I picked out a shirt I thought was red. I was pretty proud of myself. Came downstairs and said, see the dean, I'm wearing red today. Well, the dean took one look at me and said, honey, I'm afraid to tell you, that's not red. That's Russ Brown. So let me ask you, is this red or is this Russ Brown? Then, we get to church. We had the Advent wreaths there. You remember the Advent wreaths with the candles of purple, and of course, we also had the pink candle, and that candle was starting to go down, and I thought, maybe I should run downstairs and get another pink candle, so that we have one that's, you know, a little bit better to display for the video. So I went down, brought up a candle, put it in, and said, Nadine, you can see I put in a new pink candle. She took one look at it and said, Dear, I hate to tell you, that's not pink. You know, this is my reality. Being someone who's colorblind, I've just gotten used to over the years having to ask sales clerks strange questions. I've got used to over the years Nadine or Coral just rolling their eyes or giving me those comments and saying, Dad, dear, you got it wrong once again. That's my life as someone who is colorblind. Now, it's not a choice, is it? That's the way God made me. That's the way I was born. Some forms of blindness is not a choice, is it? Think of physical sight. Some of that kind of blindness is not a choice either. We know of people who have been blind since birth. And we know of other people who have gradually become blind over the years. Whether it's as a result of cataracts, or glaucoma, or macular degeneration like my mother has. Those people don't have a choice when it comes to blindness, do they? But, as that slide says, some blindness can be a choice. And you know what I mean by that. Think of some people who choose to be blind to problems happening at work, or maybe at home, or in their marriage. Or how some people choose to be blind to some of their bad habits, their anger, their unforgiveness. Or how some people might be blind to some of the addictions in their life whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs or other addictions. So yes, sometimes we can't choose our blindness, but other forms of blindness can be a choice. Now, we've been journeying with Jesus, haven't we? Looking carefully at some of the words that he has spoken. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at his words when he was just 12 at the temple and realized that when he said, I must be in my father's house. That he was pointing out why he speaks with such authority. Because his words are not his own. They come from the father. And then remember last week we looked at his words. When he said, it should be done. We must do all that God requires. 
That is why he was baptized today. We're going to look at Jesus' words to his disciples, his first disciples. Come and see. And realize the significance of those words. That Jesus doesn't want us to be blind to certain things when it comes to spiritual matters. No. What Jesus wants us to do is come and see all that is involved when it comes to a life with him. And that's what makes today's story so unique and so powerful. When you really dig deep into our story, we see five different things that Jesus wants us to choose to see very clearly in our spiritual life. What are those five things? Well, the first thing that Jesus wants us to clearly see is this. How John the Baptist understood his gifts and accepted his calling. And isn't that what Jesus wants everyone to see? Remember how our story started off. John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And then Jesus walked by. And what did John the Baptist say? Look, there is the Lamb of God. He knew what his calling was was to point people to Jesus. And did he get upset or angry at his two disciples for following Jesus? No. Would other rabbis have been upset? Probably. But remember, John the Baptist fully understood what his calling was, to point other people to Jesus. So that's why he wasn't jealous. That's why he was so accepting in that situation. And that is something Jesus wants everyone to see. That we all have gifts. We all have callings. And that we need to not only accept them, but to use them. Like John the Baptist did. That's the first thing that Jesus wants us to come and see when it comes to a life of discipleship. But that's not the only thing. Our story shows us that Jesus wants us to see. Jesus also wants us to discover this, that he desires a relationship with us. Do you remember what Jesus' response was when he turned around and saw those two followers? What do you want? Kind of a strange question, isn't it? And I'm sure it caught these two disciples off guard because one was Andrew, the other was the Gospel writer John, one of the eventual disciples of Jesus. Now you think that their first response would have been, are you really the Lamb of God? Are you really the Messiah? Tell us about yourself. Tell us about where you've been all this time. Why now? Don't you think that should have been their first response? But no. I think they were caught off guard by Jesus' words. But, Here's what Jesus wanted them to see. Come and see for yourself that I am the Lamb of God, that I am the Messiah. And what a better way to start off a relationship with these disciples than to say to them, come and see where I am staying. Spend time over a meal with me. Let's have a discussion together. Let's sit outside afterwards and look up at the stars, have a campfire, and begin to have even more conversations. Jesus desired to have a relationship with them. And did you notice what happened after they came to see that this is Jesus' desire to have a relationship with each and every one of us? Before, they referred to him as rabbi. But the very next day, what was Andrew referring to Jesus as? The Messiah. The Christ. So the first thing that Jesus wants every person to see is this. That God gives them a calling and gifts. And he used them like John the Baptist. The second thing our story shows that Jesus wants us to come and see. His desire to have a relationship with him. The third thing we see in his conversation with Peter is this. That Jesus desires us to see that he wants to change the character for us. 
Remember, when Andrew introduced Simon, his brother, to Jesus, what did Jesus do? He looked at Peter closely and intently. And then he said, you are Simon, son of John. But you will become Peter, which means Cephas, which means the rock. You see what Jesus wanted Peter to see? I want to change your character. I want to change the traits in you for the better. So that you will become a rock. You will become a leader. And Jesus wants to do the same in each and every one of us. Whether that is to change us to become more patient, more loving, more forgiving, more gentle, more kind, whatever. He wants to change our character to become more Christ-like. And he wants us to see, just as he had that desire for Peter, he has that desire for each and every one of us. But we don't stop there on the things that Jesus wants us to come and see. Fourth, as we see in his conversation with Philip and Nathaniel, he wants us to also see there is fulfillment in following him. Do you remember when he was introduced to Philip? Do you remember Jesus' words to him? Come and follow me. Nothing else. Come and follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the same place that Andrew and Peter were. So very likely, he too was a fisherman, just like Andrew and Peter. He had a call. He had a job. He probably had family in Bethsaida. He had responsibilities. But obviously there was one thing missing in his life. Fulfillment. True fulfillment in his life. And doesn't that explain why he dropped everything and came to follow Jesus? And as Jesus pointed out to Nathaniel, there is true fulfillment if you come and follow me. Because you remember his words to Nathaniel? Do you believe just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree, you will see greater things than this. Isn't that fulfillment? You will see greater things than this. Just as he wanted to give a life of fulfillment to Philip and Nathaniel. He wants us to see the same things. If we want a life that's truly fulfilling, and I'm not saying easy, fulfilling, then follow him. And the final thing that Jesus wants us to see is this. That he is aware of our good traits as well as our bad traits. But accepts us and loves us despite. And don't we see that in his conversation with Nathaniel? Now remember, he pointed out that Nathaniel was a man with no deceit. But he wasn't perfect. Because remember, when he said about Jesus at first, what good could come out of Nazareth? Philip told them that they had found the Messiah, that he had come out of Nazareth. But you remember last week, when I told you about the biases that many Jews had towards people from Nazareth? They looked down upon them. They thought many people from Nazareth had compromised their belief their ways of life, because there was a Roman garrison that was situated there. So as we see, Jesus was very aware of his prejudice that Nathaniel had, but Jesus let him know, I'm aware of your good traits, as well as your bad traits, but I love you despite. Come and follow me. Jesus' words, come, and see. And as we journey through this story of the call of the disciples, we see five things that Jesus wants us to clearly see when it comes to following him. But you remember what I pointed out at the beginning? When it comes to, say, my color blindness, or maybe physical deterioration of one's eyes, there are some things we are blind to that is beyond our control. But when it comes to these matters, 
spiritual matters. Some things we may choose to be blind to. So let me ask you. Jesus has said to you, come and see. When it comes to the things that Jesus wants us to see about a life of following him, are you choosing to see? Or are you choosing to be blind towards? So look at John the Baptist. He saw his gifts. He saw his calling. Do you see the gifts that God has given you? Are you choosing to see his calling for you at this time? Or are you turning a blind eye and choosing not to see them at all? Or look at Andrew and John. Jesus said, come and see that I want a relationship with you. Do you see how much Jesus desires this relationship? Do you see Christianity is about a relationship, not a religion? Are you blind to the fact that he doesn't want a relationship with you? Come and see. Are you choosing to see his desire to have that relationship with you? Then think of Philip. Think of Peter. Jesus wanted him to see how he wanted to change his character for the better. Have you come to see that? Do you see the ways that Jesus is trying to change you for the better? Or are you turning a blind eye to that and not letting Jesus change you for the better? Or how about Philip? Do you see that Jesus wants to make your life more fulfilling? That yes, there is sacrifice involved in following him? Or are you turning a blind eye to the sacrifices needed to follow Christ and just choose a life of convenience instead? Or take Nathaniel. As Jesus pointed out, he sees the good traits and the bad traits. Do you see the good traits that Jesus has given you, but are turning a blind eye to the bad traits that you have acquired? Jesus' words to us in the call of the disciples is to come and see. And as we've discovered, as we've gone through this journey of we've asked these questions, if there are any ways that we are choosing to turn a blind eye to spiritual growth and the ways that Christ wants to change us for the better, then Jesus' words to those two disciples are Jesus' words to you and I. Come and see. Come and see my desire to have a relationship with you. Come and see the ways I want to change you to become more Christ-like. Come and discover your gifts and your calling. Come to see the ways that I'll fulfill your life for the better. And come and see that even if you have some bad qualities or traits, I'm accepting. You can come to me. I will love you despite and have a relationship with you. This should be what we want to see in our life. Not just a half-committed discipleship. Not just making Jesus in our own way or form. No. To come and see how Jesus wants us to live as disciples. And if we are not doing so, today is the day to begin to come and see the life of true discipleship. And as we see with the disciples, it doesn't change overnight, no. They went on a three-year journey with Jesus. And little by little, day by day, they'd come to see all these things and changed in the ways that Christ wanted them to see. And let's be honest. If we don't do it now, when will we do it? When will we make that decision to come and see? Because if we don't do it now, if we don't do it later, one day it will be too late. And that will be in heaven. Can you imagine getting to heaven and then having Jesus say to us, Come, I want you to see all the things I wanted to do for you in your life. All the ways I wanted to change you for the better. How I wanted to use your gifts. 
How I desire for you to have even a closer relationship with me. And by that time, it's too late. We'll have so many regrets that we didn't come and see and discover and experience all that Christ wants us to see. So if you're choosing to be blind in any way, may today be your epiphany. That you follow Jesus' words and come and see. And for any of you, who ever come into, say, home sense, or come to any store and you see me looking confused as I'm trying to pick out colors, I hope that you come over and see if I need any help. And don't be afraid to tell me, Dean, that's not gold, or Dean, that's not red. And don't be afraid if you shake your head or make a funny comment because my loved ones already do that. I'm used to it. So come and see. God bless and amen. Our hymn is Amazing Grace. My chains are God.
people. And as we know, there's so much we need to be praying about in these days and times. There's so many people who are depressed, so many people who are struggling, whether it's physically or financially or emotionally or spiritually. So let us pray as a community of faith. Gracious and almighty God, once again, God, you've empowered us today by us hearing those words, come and see. Because as we went through each and every one of those options, it's just so amazing of all the things you want us to see that will lead to a more fulfilling life. And yes, God, there are ways that we can turn a blind eye towards some of those things. Whether it's busyness or distractions, whether it's just maybe we're afraid or frightened, to really come and see everything that's involved in true discipleship. Help us to put those things aside and to make the journey that the disciples did. To really come and see everything that you want us and desire for us to see because we don't want to live with regrets at the end, no. As long as we still have time. Whether we're young or old, whether we're in our 20s or 50s or 70s, 80s or 90s, it doesn't matter. You want us to see certain things, and we want to see them. So may we take you up on your calling and come and see, and show us, and help us discover all the things that you want and desire for us. We know, God, these are tough times. As we go through this pandemic, every week brings different challenges. This week with no vaccines coming to Canada. This week as we see more deaths. We know, God, many are struggling. So we pray for those who are struggling physically. Those who have health issues at this time, be with them, God. Help them to get the care that they need. For those who have COVID, we just ask, God, that you heal them in your perfect way and your perfect timing. We pray for those on the front lines that are offering care in these situations. We know many of them are vulnerable. Many of them are tired and exhausted. We just ask, God, that you watch over them, sustain them, and help them through their journey right now. We pray for many who have lost loved ones recently. We know it's never easy to lose a loved one, but in these days and times when there's restrictions on having funerals, having celebrations of life that can help in the grieving, be with those who are grieving. Lift their spirits and touch their souls, God. Fill them with memories of their loved ones in your care. We pray for those who are struggling financially at this time. Whether as individuals, whether as businesses, we know there's been so much sacrifice, so much loss. Help them, God, to know that you'll be there to provide for them. We pray for the lost at this time. We know, God, that for us as believers, one of the things that has sustained us and kept us going is our relationship with you. And we can't imagine getting through something like this without you. So we pray for the lost at this time and just ask God that you draw them closer and closer to you, that they will recommit their lives to having a relationship with you. We pray for our leaders. We know this isn't an easy time for our leaders. And maybe we haven't always agreed with certain decisions, but they're human like us. They're trying to do what is best. And we just pray for our leaders and ask for your hand upon them and that they will seek your wisdom and guidance and strength in this. We pray for our children, especially those who might be struggling at home learning, maybe frustrated that they can't get to school or just frustrated they're not with their friends. Help our young children to get through these days and times. It's tough enough for us. Help them, God. We pray for parents. We know that many parents are finding this one of their hardest challenges. Staying calm, 
staying patient, not becoming frustrated with the circumstances, not taking it out on their children. Be with all parents at this time too, God. Help them to deal with these challenges, to be uplifted by you through them, and to be strengthened and comforted by you. Where would we be without prayer, God? And we thank you for this time of prayer. Help us to be a praying people. Help us to be a believing people. Help us to show your light and to show your love in this world. We offer our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let us join in our closing piece today. Will you come and follow me? Oh, be with you. 